Hey guys, if you want to support my show, then you should think about joining my Patreon. At my Patreon, I offer all kinds of amazing perks in exchange for your financial support. From live streams of my interviews as they are happening, to bonus Q and A's, behind the scenes photos and videos of my shoots, plus cool merch like stickers, mugs, and hoodies, we have you covered. So go to patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered, and while you're at it, make sure that you click that subscribe button so you don't miss a single one of my new updates. There is a real talent to being able to do dirty talk. I mean, it's some of these girls that I shoot, like a great example, like Cherie Deville, Love. I mean, the things that come out of their mouth, I'm like, where did you come up with that? And, <laughs> and I'll ask them afterwards and they're like, I don't know. Yeah. It just comes out of my mouth. Yeah. It's just like, it's incredible. Cause it, I mean, it's like the ultimate ad lib. Oh yeah. You know? Oh yeah. And you have yeah, to it, be it, able it to. Is, it is improv. You do have to yes and yes. with Dirty Talk. Yeah. And and also with, with Dirty Talk specifically, it would seem like to me in a conversation on the phone, you have to like read the cues without being able to see the face of the person that you're speaking to and amend maybe what you're talking about to whatever they want. I, I had, um, I don't know if you know who Amberly Rothfield is. Oh, totally. Absolutely. So yes. she came on my show a while ago and she did phone sex and it was just so interesting because she talked about this one guy who just wanted to hear her talk about triangles. Oh yeah. You know? And so she would have to just describe different things that were triangles. <laughs> And that was like his Sosceles baby. Yeah. I was just like, and I was trying to like understand what, you know what I mean? 45 degrees. He was just, and then there was another story about how she was talking to some guy who was like hiding from his wife mm. um, while he was talking to her. So he like got in the trunk of the car, but then accidentally locked himself in there. Classic. So then like she had to like help him get out. Trunk of the car. And then that intense traumatic experience created a being locked in the trunk of a car fetish. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> that's, I don't know. That's what would happen to me probably. <laughs> You're like, honey, you gotta, you gotta throw me in the back of the, throw me in the back of the car and drive me around. <laughs> like in that movie out of sight. Have you seen that movie? The Steven Soderbergh so. movie, George Clooney and Jennifer Lopez get caught in the trunk of a car together. It's very steamy. Mm. Highly recommend. I'll have to check it out. Cool. <laughs> so what do you think is the most surprising thing that you learned about the phone sex industry doing this podcast? You know, I've said this before, but it really is that, I don't know. It was like surprising, but in some ways, I guess not surprising that like the more things change, the more they stay the same. Mm -hmm. Like the way that the, I guess the most surprising thing that I learned is that the operators at this company, you know, they worked in a phone room. So they had like a physical, remember when you would go to work in a physical place? Um, <laughs> and so they would go to a room that you just to look at it, you would think it would be like a telecommunications office. Mm -hmm. um, and they had, they had shifts and they got healthcare, which is like, and like employment status and like tax forms and everything. So like, you know, uh, in that, like in some ways we can critique that level of respectability. Like you don't need to have that sort of conventional level of respectability in order to have your job be seen as like legitimate and like dignified at the same time, like these kinds of basic labor rights are things that, uh, that unions fight for that, um, you know, that, like freelancers, especially in today's gig economy, mm -hmm. like have to fight for the idea that like something like that could be centralized. And also like all of the uh, sort of like regulations and pushback that I was talking about from the phone companies uh, on a corporate level from, uh, you know, the FCC and government uh, regulations, um, you know, from like anti-porn, like political pundits and like sort of cultural forces like that the company was like absorbing all of that. Mm -hmm. And of course the operators I'm sure had to deal with their own like interpersonal stigma in, mm -hmm. in their lives, like figuring out whether they're going to be like out to the people in their lives about the fact that they got paid to talk dirty for a living um, and all that kind of thing. Uh, and in some ways they also were like looked down upon by other people in the company, which is something we definitely explore in the show. But like, on the level of sort of like the world coming for them, they did actually have the, the, the protection of, it was the responsibility of 
the company itself to deal with that because it was also in their best interest to do so. They mm-hmm. didn't do it to protect their labor force. They mm-hmm. did it to protect their own asses. Right. And so today, even though like content creation platforms online have made it possible for sex workers to seize the means of production and, uh, and like control their own content and to a certain degree, like control their own brand and say like, this is what I want to shoot. This is what I don't want to shoot. This is who I want to work with. This is who I don't. And like set up their own operations at the same time, those like financial pressures and those political pressures and like the sort of the, like social stigma against sex work, like is the same as it ever was. Yeah. And now like, you know, the, the platforms are not protecting the content creators when it comes to that kind of thing. Like mm-hmm. each individual sex worker, like has to like deal with the fact that, you know, last year in 2021, there was the whole only fans like debacle about like, we're not doing adult content anymore. Oh, wait we are and like the pressure from visa and mastercard and all of that like sex workers are the ones who are like well now i can't pay rent anymore or like somebody's scamming by asking for a charge back on a service that i provided now that money's coming out of my pocket instead of the company's pocket so mm-hmm. it surprised me to see like all of the things that like I'm engaged with in like my work in my community now, like applied to this company that in a lot of superficial ways, like seems really different Mm -hmm. and sex work seems really different. Um, but I guess I was surprised by all the things that are, that are still the same. The struggle is still the same. I think. What do you think about like the future? Do you have hope for the future of sex work? Or do you think it's a battle we're just going to always have? I'm a bit of a Pollyanna. Like I, I, I always have, have hope, um, for, I'm always like utopia envisioning. Um, I, I mean, I think the thing that gives me hope is that another thing that has changed is that, and that the internet has facilitated for better or worse is sex workers being able to form communities, both like using the internet to form and organize like communities locally, um, but also connecting with other workers all over the world. And I think that those platforms also give us the opportunity to like share our stories and like also say like what what we demand like from the industry, like what respect we uh, we deserve for the work that we do. Mm-hmm. And um, so I think that if there's any if there's any hope, it's in people like listening to sex workers and sex workers like organizing in a way that there's like clear messaging like now that we have your attention here's what we want and here's how we're gonna make it happen um and i mean i think that i think that people are always going to want adult entertainment and i think that that's beautiful and i think that we should be continuing to provide that and we should get the respect that we deserve for providing something as like fundamental to people's like joy and exploration and like, I don't know, like storytelling is a fundamental part of being human and like sex is part of being human. So why can't we like tell stories about sex, even if they're very crude stories that we're telling with our bodies, like um, let's like, let's keep doing it. And like, that's why destigmatizing as well as like the idea of like decriminalizing um, the industry is so important to me. Like yeah. people should stop fucking judging. Yeah. 